time is up, so we must now move on to questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. And again, we will start with topical questions. Mr Fran McCann was listed first, but uh, he contacted the business office within the appropriate time and withdrew his name. So I call Mr Sean Lynch. Would the Minister agree with me that his department has failed children in care, and does he intend to hold an inquiry into care of children here? Well, in terms of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, uh, I think that the blame lies first and foremost with the perpetrators, not the department. And the blame should always lie first and foremost with perpetrators of violence or sexual violence or any other kind of violence. And what the department has done um, over the course of the last number of years was, first of all, uh, we asked and, uh, Bernardo's uh, to produce a report and paid for that report to be produced in 2009 because we recognised that there was a risk there. And subsequent to the production of that report, we have taken a series of actions, including the establishment of a safeguarding board in Northern Ireland. Not all of the responsibility lies with the department. Uh, the police have a role and the Department of Justice have a role. And whenever young people themselves don't believe that they are the victims of violence, or sexual violence, you have a great difficulty because many of these young people um, wrongly uh, perceive uh, that they are being appreciated and shown some kind of care and attention whenever what is really happening is that it is malign attention that they are receiving uh, for people who have uh, evil purposes. So let us be very clear about where the blame lies. The blame lies with people who go after young, vulnerable people, and it's not just children in care, because 80 per cent of the children who are targeted by child so se sexual exploiters um, are not children who are in care, and we need to get the appropriate messages out here. So can I ask the Minister, can he assure the public that children in care today are safe? Well, I think, first of all, it's very important to indicate that children in residential care homes are in homes. And that's why they're not locked up, because it is to be a home. It is not a prison. And therefore, young people have the ability to exercise some discretion and free will. And we have identified that actually those young people who are most vulnerable, and, and we have for a ver variety of reasons, um, took them to secure accommodation, very quickly reverted back to, to how they were behaving uh, previously, uh, and that clearly locking young people up does not work. So it is a very difficult circumstance. Um, we will highlight to young people over and over again repeat, repeatedly of the issues and problems um, that, that can come to them um, as a result of engaging with the wrong types of people, how to avoid it, what to watch out for. Um, to when to seek support and all of that. And we will continue to work with the police. And I think it is very important that we do recognise, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, that in all of this, I am sure that we can um, move things forward and that we can improve things, because care of young people has improved um, over the past 10 years, improved over the previous 10 years, and I have no doubt that there are things we will be doing in future years which are better than today. And we need to ensure that uh, we pay heed to everything that comes to our attention and we act upon it, and that is what we are seeking to do on a daily basis. I call Mr Jim Allister. Will the Minister give residential, uh, statutory residential care homes for the elderly a chance, an opportunity to prove their viability by doing a U-turn on this policy of restricting new admissions? Well, the, the policy of restricted admissions is obviously something that a, a number of trusts have applied, not all of the trusts, I should say. Um, last year, for example, the Western Trust had an open admission policy. Uh, Eighty per cent of the people in the Western Trust chose not to actually use the statutory residential homes. They opted for private residential homes. So uh, Mr Allister's point is not a, a, a um, resolve the thing in and of itself, uh, the issue. So I would suggest that <clears throat> in terms of uh, residential care homes for, for the elderly, we need to look at the widest range of options for our elderly population and seek to meet their needs. But what should be 
front and centre of all of these things is the person, not the facility, and the needs of that person, and where best those needs are met. And if those needs are best met in a statutory residential care home, that's not something um, that I'm opposed to. Uh, the Minister likes in this issue to hide behind the trusts, but it is his policy to restrict admissions. He told this House on the 9th of October last year, uh, when he introduced transforming your care, that therefore there would be a restriction on new admissions to statutory care homes. It is that which is starving the homes of the oxygen of occupants, which makes them capable of working. Take Pinewood in my constituency. 36 bed unit, starved of admissions to the point where it now has nine residents. Isn't the minister quite clearly clinging to a policy designed to close those homes? Why does he fear lifting that ban to let those homes prove themselves? Just in case uh, Mr Alistair would uh, take the Assembly down the, the wrong line on this issue, um, I think you'll find that there's more than nine residents in, in Pinewood, um, albeit nine permanent residents, um, but there's many people who use that facility for respite care as well. Um, so just to clarify that matter. And the truth is that had Mr Alistair had his way and the Trust had made their recommendations, does he honestly think that a direct rule minister would have stepped in as I stepped in, Mr Alistair's policy would have ensured the closure of Pinewood Residential Care Home. And Mr Alistair doesn't like the truth and he doesn't like the facts. And that's why, why, why he's Order. behaving as he is. I, I, would, I would wish that Mr Alistair, and indeed anybody else in the Assembly on this issue, would actually go and visit some of the new facilities that we have developed. I recently opened one in Downpatrick. It was down in Carrick Fergus, one that's not very far from Mr. Alistair's constituency. And I would urge people to actually gain a little knowledge in this subject about the standards of care that we might be able to offer our elderly population, a higher standard of care than is currently in place, and talk to the residents who will say, this is much better, talk to the staff who will say, this is much better, and talk to the families who will say this is much better, rather than hyping up and scurring elderly people who are currently in residential care homes unnecessarily. Okay, listen, if you ask a question, the Minister, you should have managed to listen to the answer. Could I call Mr Alistair Ross? Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Minister will be aware of uh, continued coverage about the issue of organ donation in recent days. Can the Minister provide an update on the survey work that his department was carrying out about public attitudes towards organ donation in Northern Ireland? Well, the public health agency team conducted a face-to-face -face survey of the general public over the early summer with a representative sample of 1,012 individuals, which is a fairly uh, large number. And that was done on the basis of age, gender, social class and local government districts, so it was widespread. Um, the focus groups and stakeholder engagement also took place with health service staff, the BMA uh, charities, recipients those on the waiting list and donor families. And that work has now been concluded. And uh, I understand they uh, uh, finalised a report on their findings. So in all of this, I, I think that there is some very interesting uh, views coming out um, on organ donation. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done um, with the general public on this issue uh, to ensure that we can move and advance forward and ensure that there is more organ donation takes place in Northern Ireland with the support of the public. Supplementary from Mr Ross. Thank you. Can the Minister confirm that that uh, report will be published? Um, can he indicate to the House when he would anticipate that that will be done? And are there any early findings um, from the work that's been carried out that would be of particular interest to the Assembly? I understand that the All Party Group on Organ Donation actually meets next week. Um, we would be very happy to make that report available to that group. I think that, that would be an appropriate um, opportunity to do it. Um, the PHA team, um, I have no doubt, will make themselves available to, to, to make a presentation uh, if they are requested. And I do appreciate the, the public and political interest um, on this issue. And if it is not possible to, for the all-party group to actually receive such a report, I will endeavour to have the report published um, in, the, in the very near future. Uh, so 
I think that the public need to know uh, what the responses are, and we need to give attention to what the public say on these issues, um, because I do think that it is a representative sample and will indicate very clearly uh, where the Northern Ireland public stand on this issue. And I call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. This is my uh, first topical question. Can I extend my thanks to the staff of the Procedures Committee who undertook to develop my proposal to introduce topical questions and indeed extend my gratitude to my own Assembly researcher, Gareth Scott, whose idea it was to uh, proceed down this route? Can I ask, therefore, I think it's worth putting that on record. Can I ask the Minister, therefore, uh, why he is currently using scarce uh, public funds for legal cases against blood donation and adoption when his responsibility is to deliver a system that assesses uh, the health and safety of blood and indeed whether parental placements are in the best interests of the child. Well, uh, I thank the member for his modesty in the first instance. <laughs> uh, an old saying, self-praise is no recommendation. Uh, in terms of, of, of the issues that the members raised, I, I wasn't aware that I had went to court with anybody. However, if someone takes you to court, you do have to respond. It would be quite foolish not to respond. And it's very interesting that uh, we have uh, public money being used in terms of um, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission, which is a publicly funded body, taking uh, government to court. And we also have legal aid being used. And uh, we await the outcome um, in the not too distant future of one of those cases. So let, let's just see what, what, what happens as a result of that. In terms of the gay adoption, let's be absolutely unequivocal. Um, I'm just after saying that we need to pay attention to the public whenever they speak. And whenever uh, the direct rule minister, whenever, whenever the direct rule minister actually went for a consultation, that consultation revealed that over 95% of the community were opposed to gay adoption. Now, there's assembly members here, and it strikes me that they would prefer that the courts make the decisions as opposed to this House making the decisions. And with respect to the courts, this assembly is elected to represent the people of Northern Ireland. It is a crucial part of the democratic process. And we would do well to pay attention to the democratic will. And that is exactly what I am doing, Mr. Uh, De Principal Deputy Speaker, in reflecting this. I have to say that my stance was further strengthened last week when a piece of research by Queen's University Belfast and the British Association uh, for Adoption and Fostering carried out a report on looked after children. And it found that 99% of children who had been adopted had stability. This report started in 2003 as a longitudinal report and was only published last week. 99% of children in adoptive circumstances in Northern Ireland find stability. I remind the Minister that the two minute rule applies in Very the uh, Mr. Mr. Principal, um, And that was because, and they put this, of the rigorous assessment process that takes place. So no apologies to make for not uh, repairing something which isn't broken in the first place. <laughs> Mr Little for supplementary. Oh, um, thank the Minister for his response and his emphasis on the need for rigorous assessment. But how can the public be confident that he is using public funds in a responsible manner when he continues to lose legal proceedings yeah. on these issues? Yeah. Well, um, that... that that is a matter for the courts in terms of the decisions that they, that they make and the arguments that are put. But let me be absolutely clear. The courts have found, uh, European courts have found, that there is no human right to adopt. So let's just nail that at the outset. This is not about adopters. It is about the children. And we in Northern Ireland are in a different circumstance from the rest of the United Kingdom in that we have... Uh, don't have as many children on the waiting list for adoption as would be the case um, in England, Scotland and Wales. So in Northern Ireland, we have a very robust adoption system. I'm prepared to bring forward adoption legislation to this House and would have been bringing forward adoption legislation to this House that would, that would have um, upgraded it and improved it. 
Um, however, because others have decided to rush to court, that has been delayed. And I think that that is damaging to democracy. And I would have thought that Mr. Little should be a defender of democracy instead of trying to uh, do down democracy. Uh, but he may wish to do things through the courts. I would rather do things through the ballot box. Thank you. And that's the end of the period for topical questions. And we will now move on to those oral questions that have been listed for the Minister. And I call Mrs. Karen McKevitt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question one. It's not possible to make exact predictions of this nature. Demand for residential and nursing home care is dependent on a range of variables, including levels of disability, the prevalence of conditions such as dementia, and availability of alternative forms of support such as domiciliary care. Moving forward, I fully support the general principle that home should be the hub of care for older people. I wish to see a shift away from the provision of care in institutional settings to the provision of treatment, care and support closer to home. As this policy takes effect, I'd expect to see more of our older people supported to maintain their independence in their own home. In August 2013, the Health and Social Care Board, as part of its project Improving Services for Older People, a new process for consulting, engaging and implementing change, published a project initiation document on the future of statutory residential homes. As part of that project, the Board is currently in the process of developing criteria, which will likely include a measurement of the demand for statutory residential care, which could be applied locally at trust level. The criteria will be subject to public consultation in the near future. I would however like to provide the assurance that this does not mean that residential and nursing home care will not be available in the future. I fully recognise that for some people, support in their home may not be the best option, and the HSC will work with providers in the independent and voluntary community sector to ensure continued supply of residential and nursing home care. Mr. McEvitt for a supplementary. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister how he intends to provide these vulnerable elderly people with the level of care that they require in the absence of the statutory homes? Well, th there's a range of things. In, in the first instance, um, I think that we should always seek uh, to provide support for people at home uh, with the option of staying in their own home and providing the, the appropriate and adequate support for them. And sometimes direct payments can be a means of, of doing that, uh, where, family, or where people do have strong support from families and can utilise that uh, as a much more flexible service than sometimes um, we offer from the statutory sector. Uh, secondly, uh, I think that we do need to ensure uh, that we look at the options of provided supporting living facilities. Uh, and that is something which is a growing trend. Um, I indicated uh, the very successful one in her own constituency in Down Patrick, uh, and I would um, urge uh, her to visit that particular facility because I think that uh, she would be wholly impressed um, by the service uh, that is being provided there. And then we have the options of the private sector, uh, and we still have the options of the statutory residential sector uh, as well as things stand. Gregory Campbell. Uh, Fanilla McAndrew from the uh, Health and Social Care Board was interviewed last month, Minister, and indicated when being questioned that no elderly resident would be forced to leave their home. Um, can the Minister reassure those residents, like my, my constituents in Thackeray Place in Limavady, that that is the case, <coughs> and uh, refute those who are party politicking and using elderly residents for their own particular ends? Well, I'd have to say that Thackeray House is one of the, the strongest homes and, and one of the homes with the strongest cases for remaining open into, you know, lo, well into the future because uh, it is you know, very heavily occupied, um, I think, with some 27 or 8 permanent places out of 32. So that, that is a facility which clearly is very popular in the local community. Um, and very often these things you are looking at what alternatives are available, and I don't believe that there is... Um, uh, a, a, an alternative available in Lima Valley Town itself. Um, so those things are all issues that are taken into account. The process that we are engaged in, because the other process was a flawed process, uh, and let me be very clear about that, and that's why I stopped it. Uh, and this process is not about forcing people out of their home. Uh, it's about improving the lives of older people and giving them a wider range of options. And in doing that, it's important that we do take steps uh, which will allow us to make that investment in providing better options for older people in the future. But at the same time, 
it is also critical that we treat those older people who are currently in residential care um, with the greatest degree of respect and decorum. I accept that that didn't happen, and I don't wish that failure uh, to happen again. Call Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. In, in 2009, as a backbencher, the Minister fought for the retention of statutory residential homes, but then his current policy uh, proposes their closure. How will the Minister ensure the residential care homes remain affordable and locally accessible to family and friends? And would explain his U turn. Well, that's certainly <clears throat> something for the HSCB and a course of work that they are currently doing. Uh, and looking at what is available to older people, what the best options are. <clears throat> and indeed, um, I have had the opportunity to look at the, the, the supported living model as something I believe will deliver uh, in the future for older people a much better service where they can retain a greater degree of independence um, but can have that support um, that is absolutely necessary. I can give an example of um, the elderly couple. Um, one of them takes dementia doesn't need to go into a home, but they move into a supported living facility, and as, that, <clears throat> as their need increases, the support increases for them. That couple is able to stay together, as opposed to one of them having to move into a residential care home and the other one staying in their own home. Now, if members think that that isn't a good thing and that policy is wrong, I'd love to hear somebody actually stating clearly that, that they believe that, because I believe the policy is right, and I believe that we need to go down um, this route of doing things in a very structured way unlike his colleague uh, who done things in an unstructured way and closed something like six or seven residential homes uh, in his period um, as a health minister without any opposition from Mr Beggs. I call Mr John McAllister. Deputy Speaker, if I could ask the Minister, has he had any discussions yet with uh, the Secretary of State for Health in England or indeed the Finance Minister here as regards the, the effect that a cap on residential funding that people would pay in England would have on the budget here if he were to bring in such a cap? Well, it's, it's not something that I've had direct uh, conversations with the, with the Health Minister on. Um, normally these things are, are dealt with actually through social development. Um, it's not my, my role to stand on the toes of other Ministers. Um, it will have an impact upon me. So anything that the so Department of Social Development would do, we would have to have contact with ourselves and I would express an opinion on that whenever it would come to me. Question two has been withdrawn and referred to uh, DSD for written answer. I call Ms McKayla Boyle. Question three. Question three. Whilst we have seen many improvements in the health of our population, those who are disadvantaged in our society do not have an equal chance of experiencing good health and well-being. Health and social care alone cannot fully address the issues associated with multiple deprivation. It requires joined up working across government. One of the key principles underpinning transforming our care is a commitment to focus on prevention and tackling inequalities. Changes to service provision through TYC, such as improved integration of care through the implementation of integrated care partnerships and the provision of enhanced services locally through primary and community care will improve the health and well-being of all of our population and contribute to overall progress in respect of deprivation indicators. TYC is a key element of our wider holistic approach to tackling inequalities. We already have a wide range of activities underway to target the vulnerable and disadvantaged across Northern Ireland. These include strategies and action plans with a wide range of associated indicators in respect of smoking, teenage parenthood and sexual health, mental health promotion, suicide prevention, obesity and alcohol and drug misuse, as well as the forthcoming new public health strategic framework. And we must all work together to ensure that we optimise life chances for everyone in Northern Ireland. I call Ms Michaela Boyle for supplementary. Can I further ask the Minister if EQIA will be conducting, uh, conducted in specific services of transforming your care and will there be a time process for this? Well, our department, as always, um, will, will, will follow all of the guidelines uh, related to equality issues. But let me, me, me talk a little uh, bit about equality. If we want to truly change where we are, I think we have to go back to the starting point. And the starting point is when young people are actually born. And I am very, very committed to ensuring that we give those young people the best possible chance in life. 
And I would hope that Sinn Féin will be as equally committed in the departments that they have responsibility for in ensuring that those young people have the best opportunities for life. Unlike the circumstances whenever I have to step in in West Belfast and the Shankill, whenever the funding uh, wasn't being supported uh, by the Department of Education, led by a Sinn Féin minister, it took a DUP man to sort out the people on the Falls Road. I call Ms Dolores Kelly for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Minister for his thoughts on uh, the health action zones, which many would recognise as having been a success in relation to directing uh, cross-departmental work in deprived areas, and whether or not he has any replacement model uh, in, in his uh, mind for the future? I think in all of these things, in, in terms of deprivation, um, we have to first of all identify the nature of the problem and then seek to address the problem in, in a way which is very focused. So I don't think that having Northern Ireland-wide policies as such um, does it. So, so the advantages of health action zones are fairly obvious in that instance, and that does give you a, a local perspective, and then you can, you can deliver a local response to that. So in, in all that we do, we will be seeking not to have a broad brush approach uh, to tackling these issues. Now, anti-smoking, for example, will cr cross the province and, 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 all, and, and, and such activities. Uh, but in terms of determining uh, the nature of the problem, school truancy, for example, is something which impacts upon young people's health. Um, but if you have high levels of truancy in one area, we can actually focus on that and target uh, what's going on. Um, people smoking during pregnancy, uh, maybe, well, I, I know it's an issue in some areas which is much greater than others, so, so you'd have a particular focus on that. So I think it's absolutely crucially important that we seek to get as much qualitative information as possible um, to actually tackle inequalities uh, in a very focused way, which makes best use of the, the limited resource. I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister, in relation to domiciliary care, how can the Minister use such honeyed words whenever he knows and he presides over a department that has deprived a number of rural, isolated, uh, elderly people of the community meals? The criteria has been lifted so high that there's thousands of people actually not getting a one meal per day. Well, in terms of domiciliary care, that Mr. McCarthy asked about, there's actually more money being spent in domiciliary care, there's more hours being spent in domiciliary care, and that is going to continue to be the case. We're going to invest further in domiciliary care in the years that lie ahead because it is absolutely critical to ensuring the well being uh, of people who require such care. Order, please. I call Mr. Pat Ramsey. For Principal Deputy Speaker. Members will be aware. That I met with the Republic of Ireland's Minister for Health, Dr. James Riley, TD, on the 8th of May 2013, to ask her to give consideration to a two centre model potentially providing PCCS services in both Belfast and Dublin. A further meeting of officials and clinicians took place on the 23rd of May to determine whether such a model would be feasible. And there has been ongoing engagement since then between the clinicians and officials north and south. At a further meeting with Minister Riley on the 12th of September to discuss the issues, and the discussions are likely to continue uh, over the next few weeks. I will inform the Assembly of the outcome when I announce my decision on the future commissioning of the service, which I hope to do as soon as possible. Supplementary. Yeah, I thank the Minister for, for his response. The Minister would appreciate that this is a hugely important, sensitive and emotive subject matter for so many parents across Northern Ireland. W will the Minister be reminded to give a commitment to ensuring that the network model endorsed by the BCCA working in Canada and America as a model that could be workable in terms of Northern Ireland and given that peace of mind to the parents who are so worried about their child? That is certainly the, the model that I'm pushing for um, and I need cooperation for that to happen. Uh, so I'd have to say that Minister Riley has, has been very cooperative in, in terms of uh, us looking at all of the, these things. I do think that we have more challenge in uh, issue with, with officials in both departments in terms of getting this one over the line. Uh, but uh, I am very determined uh, that we exhaust every possibility that exists here and um, we will give it every effort uh, to, to seek to ensure that we do get uh, a network facility which retains surgery in Belfast. 
I should say that we are in a better place than we were uh, some time ago whenever the proposal was that we went to England uh, and that we had the potential to lose our cardi cardiology services. I believe that the cardiology service is something that we can uh, ensure stays without um, any issue. And the English model is now something which has largely been dismissed, uh, with the exception of those level four children who have to go to England for the most complex of surgery. Uh, so it is a battle that it continues, uh, but I can assure the member that that is the model that I am pursuing. I call on Ms Pam Brown. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Can I ask him as to what um, are the key factors that are required to make the Belfast Dublin network work and is he aware of the arrangements such as a single network serving Toronto and Ottawa? Yes, I'm aware of the networks and we're also looking at on the island of Ireland there's over 500 operations um, currently taking place. Now, uh, ideally, uh, Dublin doesn't want to go less than 400. Um, and ideally, Belfast would need 200 uh, to be, enable us to offer a 24-7 service with uh, 50 adult congenital cardiac uh, procedures taking place. Um, so getting to the optimum is difficult uh, in that I don't think the border counties would bring us up to the 200 alone, um, and therefore you're going to have to go deeper into the south of Ireland for that um, taxi uh, work as, as, as well as you would like it to. And the other element of it is that it will be absolutely important and critical that our surgeons and our anaesthetists uh, and our theatre teams uh, would have the opportunity to uh, engage in surgery in Dublin um, so that their skills are right up there at the very highest level and um, that would make it more attractive uh, for young surgeons to come to Belfast. Uh, I did meet with the surgeons and they don't believe that it's uh, impossible to recruit, um, so there, there is some hope there. And uh, I'd have to say that our cardiologists are, are so highly respected for the care that they provide and in the way that they do it. And I think that we have something to offer the Republic of Ireland in terms of the cardiology service. It is so excellent, um, and we can support people in the border counties in that respect. Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his words. And can I declare an interest as having a, a seven-month-old seven son still waiting cardiac procedures in Belfast? And I can endorse the Minister's words when he speaks highly enough of the surgeons and the staff in the Royal Victoria. Ministers, maybe only anecdotally, but parents I talk to daily and weekly up in there now seem to be sending children to England for some routine operations. And I know I've asked for statistics in regard to that in comparison to the number we're now sending to Dublin. Minister, can you explain to me why are there still restrictions in place on performing some paediatric cardiac procedures still in place in Belfast, whereas they have been deemed safe to be performed there, and why we're still sending children across to England? Well, I, I understand that, that a criteria was applied um, by the HSC, and PHA in, in, in conjunction with others, um, which led to certain uh, surgical procedures not actually taking place in Belfast. Uh, and I understand subsequent to that there was an independent assessment of that decision and the independent assessment of the decision indicated that it was wrong. Um, so that very question has been asked of uh, the, the, the relevant bodies um, and, and actually uh, just this week. So uh, I, whenever I, I get an answer to that from, from the bodies involved as to why they haven't changed that decision, um, then I'm very happy to bring it back to this House. I call Mr. Cahill Boyle. Guest Ever Coo, Glad Hall, uh, question number five, please. My department continually reviews all of its policies and standards for health and social care services to ensure that they do not unreasonably discriminate against any group. The fundamental principle is that access to health and social care services must be on the basis of prioritised accessed health or social care needs. As the policy intentions and scope of the proposed new AIDS discrimination legislation becomes clear, we shall, of course, include them in our review processes to ensure that they are properly reflected in core policies and standards for health and social care. Hello. I call Cahill Boylan for his supplementary. Thank you. Gar Margaret, I pray, uh, 
last time Corley August going break a session area as Dr. Agra. Could I thank the Minister for his answer? But in view of the commitment on the transforming your cure uh, to ensure people can remain remain longer in, in their homes, um, does the Minister not agree that a review now would be even more relevant? Or Mill Moggett? Well, in, in terms of these things, obviously um, we have an Northern Ireland executive uh, and when it comes to issues around equality, that falls within the office of the First and Deputy First Minister. And um, in terms of uh, AIDS discrimination, that uh, would appropriately fall um, to that department. So, um, you know, in some respects, I suppose a simple answer would be above my pay grade. Uh, but uh, being more serious about it and, and, and not to be flippant, um, we do want to ensure that elderly people do receive the appropriate level of support and care. I think it is incumbent upon us to ensure that is the case, and it is incumbent upon us throughout government to work closely with each other on ensuring that we have uh, all of the checks and balances in place uh, that will uh, make it less likely um, that anybody, um, and in particular older people, um, are not discriminated, in, uh, discriminated against or indeed um, get on for a treatment uh, from government. Well, Mr. Peter Weir for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for his answers so far. Can the Minister give us an update on the Older Persons Service Framework? Well, the aim of the service framework is to improve health and well-being for older people, um, their carers, their families, uh, by promoting that social inclusion, reducing inequalities in health and social well-being, and improving the quality of care. And the framework for older people sets standards relating to person-centred care, health and social well-being, improvements, safeguarding, cares, conditions more common in older people, medicines management and, tra and transitions of care, and the OFM DFM strategy for older people ageing in an inclusive society has been developed to update the direction of travel for older people's services, and the service framework for older people reflects and reinforces the core principles um, of that strategy, and these will shape and guide implementation. I call on Mr. Raymond McCartney. Uh, let the whole question number six, please. Family support hubs are a multi-agency network of statutory, community, and voluntary organisations providing coordinated referral services for families needing early intervention services. Hubs facilitate access to services in a particular locality they do not provide services directly. The Outcomes Group in each Health and Social Care Trust area assesses the need of its resident population, including health needs, and the locality planning groups are responsible for determining the number and location of hubs to respond to identified need in their local area. Outcomes Groups and locality planning groups operate under the Regional Children and Young People's Strategic Partnership. Hubs accept referrals from a range of agencies on behalf of families in need of early intervention support services, and they use their knowledge of local service providers and the regional fam family support database to signpost families to appropriate services. The Delivering Social Change Hub Signature Project will support the existing network of hubs and develop 10 new ones. The national priority is the establishment of hubs in areas where none currently exist. for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. In, in terms of lo location of the particular hubs, will the Minister be given consideration or take due consideration of, of the recent child poverty statistics, particularly in the constituency of Foyle, North, Belf North Belfast? Well, um, I think we already have, and I'm sure the Member is aware uh, that there is hubs uh, in Craigan, in St Tallow, uh, in Waterside, in Straban, in Dry Arch, and certainly those are providing um, an excellent service. In terms of Belfast, we have four currently under development uh, to cover the north, south, east and west of the city. Uh, so in all of that, we recognise that there are families um, who uh, find things very, very tough. They need a lot of support. They need a lot of help. And if we are to truly avoid children ending up in residential care homes, we need to step in at that very early point in their lives and provide that support to those families, and indeed in some instances step in to remove children from those families if that child is at risk. 
and the hubs will help us to provide that necessary support, um, whilst the, the, the other arm will be used in terms of the more uh, enforcement line of things uh, in other areas. Uh, but the hubs will provide uh, that support to ensure that as many children stay in their own homes as possible. I call Mr. David McLevine. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. I wonder, could the Minister give the Assembly um, an update on other work that the Department is leading on um, under the Delivering Social Change model? Well, the Public Health Agency leads a, a parenting support programme, and that has five distinct elements, uh, namely Strengthening Families programme, the Infant Mental Health Training, Parenting Your Teen, Incredible Years and in Triple P, all very trendy names, I might, I might add. Uh, four of the pro programmes are in train, although at different stages of development. One programme, Triple P, has been delayed due to difficulties in identifying a suitable provider organisation. So consideration is being given whether to proceed with commissioning this programme or to diverting funding to an alternative parenting programme. We do have links with Sure Start, for example, the CAMS teams, Family Centres, Bernardo's Action for Children, NSPCC, Health Visitors, Social Workers and others to ensure that families who need support are able to access uh, relevant information easily. Well, Mr. John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I thank the, the Minister for, for his answer. And, uh, would the Minister agree that while there are indices to uh, uh, identify those areas of serious and obvious social deprivation right across Northern Ireland, there are people, even in the most affluent areas, who experience uh, these uh, impacts, and what does the Minister intend to do to ensure that those people are not uh, slipping through the net? Well, certainly, uh, the member is right to identify that there are people who are living in, in more affluent areas who, who um, have a fairly high degree of poverty, actually, in households. Uh, many of them are, are in employment, but not well-paid employment. Many of them have acquired properties. Uh, during the boom period and, and have mortgages which are excessively high uh, and, and leaves them with very, very little money for, for the day-to-day -day spend. I think it is uh, incumbent upon all of us <coughs> to support groups such as Citizens Advice Bureau, as we do, um, to give people quality information through our own uh, constituency offices, to give people as much advice as possible, um, and to be able to point people um, to the appropriate services, including free school meals. Uh, and, and people uh, who have that um, issue uh, shouldn't be embarrassed uh, to, to take free school meals because it's in the best interest of their children and may well open the doors for other um, pieces of funding uh, which they wouldn't find cur currently available. I call Ms. Katrina Ruyan. Partnership working is vital if we are to effectively tackle health inequalities. Public Health Agency and, before that, the Health Boards and Trusts have worked effectively in partnership with local government and others for many years to improve health and well-being and reduce inequalities in health through initiatives such as investing for health partnerships, health action zones and other issue-specific partnerships. A recent review of joint working arrangements has resulted in refreshed endorsement from the PHA and SOLAS, that is the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives to build on local joint working arrangements in the strategic context of the new public health framework and the reform of local government 2015. Examples of ongoing areas of collaboration include tobacco control, direct support for council enforcement uh, officers to protect people from exposure to tobacco smoke, encourage businesses to promote smoke-free environments and prevent the sale of cigarettes to children, accident prevention programme including a home safety check scene, physical activity programme through, for example, referral programmes, walking programmes, outdoor gyms and other changes to the physical environment. In addition to and in support of this work, the PHA currently funds approximately 156 voluntary and community organisations to deliver health improvement activity, with some 270 contracts supporting 6 to 700 community-based initiatives. For a quick supplementary 
Good Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, and I go and wake us the Nara than uh, Fragershaw. In an earlier answer, I was surprised to hear him uh, pass his equality duties over to another department. And in light, my question was about health, in, health inequalities. In light of his Section 75 duties, um, I asked the Minister if models to track outcomes and impact will now be developed as part of transforming your care. It just worried me slightly you were dismissing your uh, duties in relation to age. The member must have only heard part of the answer or, or, or else just wasn't listening um, because I indicated that this department would ensure that it met all of the equality standards. Uh, I, I hope that whenever she was Education Minister, she had done that with the Body Bear Trust, for example, which is seeking to help children with profound difficulties, physical difficulties, and uh, certainly didn't uh, receive any support from the member um, whenever she was Minister. Um, so when we talk about equality, equality should apply to everyone, including profoundly disabled children. Thank you. Uh, 